Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma. We have two new meditators here, two meditators here now, one is left. We're just winding down in a little over a week. I'll be heading to Florida. I'll be back in the new year. So last night, there was this idea that the ocean, the ocean is profound, deep, great, and yet compared to the Dhamma it's quite insignificant. So tonight I thought I'd expand upon that. Let's talk about significance. We start with ourselves, start with this life, this human being we call I, who has been born and is going to die, and has what some people would call endless possibilities, which is kind of a joke because we have very little possibilities as a human being. We're rather insignificant in the whole scheme of things. We can't even fly. Most of us. We can't walk through walls. We can't travel through the cosmos. We can't read people's read each other's mind. We're fairly insignificant. We can't even learn more than a handful of languages before we die and forget them all. So we have all these plans and ambitions and they're so pitiful and insignificant. Meaningless. You can imagine the angels and gods up in heaven shaking their heads or laughing at us. Maybe they make games out of us. Maybe we're like entertainment for them, like these reality shows. I bet the I bet there is a significant number of angels who use us as their live reality shows. What was it? The, the Kardashians? Wasn't there this show about or didn't Ozzy Osbourne do a show? I hear about these, I don't, of course, watch them, but you think that's interesting? Well, imagine how the angels are up in heaven, in all their different heavens. This is what they say about Mara. We're the live, what is this, what is the term? Reality, reality television? We're the reality show for Mara. The Paranimita Vasavati Devas, the angels that delight in the creations of others. That's all we are. We're just rats in a cage. They probably perform experiments on us as well. Maybe from time to time pretend to be aliens and beam down and spook the heck out of us. The angels. There's a story. There's one story that of co that of course deals with this, where the the angels hear about how short a life humans have. This one angel died in the morning, and in the afternoon came back, or disappeared in the morning, and the afternoon came back, and they asked where she'd been, and she said, "Oh, I, I was di I died, and I was born as a human, and I lived sixty sixty seven years as a human being before dying again and being born here here again in the afternoon." And they were shocked at how how short the, the life of a human is comparatively.
And we're so egotistical about it. So think how profound is this human life and this body is a temple, this body that's full of urine and feces and all things terrible. And we're so proud of it, right? We primp and prime it and we fret and worry about size and shape and color, proportions. We cover it, we uncover it, we cover and uncover it suggestively to try to attract each other, this body. So human beings are rather insignificant. So then we have the angels, but even the angels are pretty pathetic and insignificant. Angels, apparently they go to war with each other, they still argue and they have questions and debates. They're still afraid of death. They still have the potential to perform all sorts of unwholesome deeds and go to hell. They might live thousands, I don't know, millions of years even, probably in the, yeah, probably millions, thousands anyway. But even the angels even the angel realms come to an end. And the, and what of it? Apparently they spend all their time throwing flowers around, picking flowers from their beautiful flower trees and singing and dancing and carrying on and all sorts of other useless pastimes, meaningless, pointless, frivolous. And in their gardens all they end up growing is greed and attachment and partiality and aversion and ego pathetic insignificant so even the angels they're insignificant but what about the gods no the gods gods will live millions billions of years I don't know probably billions imagine living billions of years so here we are talking about this ocean, talking about the Pacific Ocean, the, the, the oceans of Earth, this Earth, this planet. How huge. Oh. Consider the scale of this planet, how insignificant one human being is oh, on the face of the planet. But how pitifully insignificant is the Earth in the face of the universe. There's so much out there. Beyond what just, beyond just what NASA and scientists and like Stephen Hawking's are, Hawking are, are capable of comprehending, aliens, aliens are the least of what's in, what exists in the universe. There's so much, so much potential not as a human being, but beyond the human. So much potential that we as human beings will never experience, not in this life. I never even, can't even fathom, for the most part. And so there's this idea in spirituality, even in science, of the vastness of the universe, of the greatness of the universe. At the level of godhood, well, surely there there's some significance. Gods are pitiful and insignificant as well. In fact, all of samsara is pitifully insignificant. The whole of this universe, no matter how big it gets, when compared with the Dhamma, it is, it is completely insignificant. 
You can show me the horse head nebula, you can show me a black hole or dark matter. Apparently now they're working on quantum computers that are neither I don't know, neither here nor there. Pitiful, meaningless, insignificant, inconsequential. It's the incredible nature of the Dhamma that it goes beyond all this, that no matter how incredibly complex and seemingly profound the universe might become, it's all pitifully insignificant, meaningless, pointless, useless, inconsequential. So we look at the we look at what the Buddha taught. We compare it to all of this, the whole universe and all of its glory and profundity. And we see something quite different. We see a different focus, a different dimension, if you will. It's the dimension of happiness and the dimension of suffering. doesn't matter how profound the universe is, in the end it all boils down to happiness or suffering. It boils down to the fact that a reality is comprised of impermanent, unsatisfying, and uncontrollable phenomena. Yang kinci sumudaya dhammang sabantang niroda dhammang all dhammas that arise are subject to cease. Doesn't matter how many there are, or how complex they are, or how varied they are. They are all governed by this law of nature, law of reality. And so it doesn't matter whether you travel the whole of the universe or be born as a god or an angel. It's no different than if you stay in your medit in your room and meditate. There's still only impermanence, unsatisfying and uncontrollable phenomena. Nothing worth clinging to, nothing worth striving for, nothing worth Nothing worth anything. This is why the Buddha said something quite, I suppose, depressing sounding. He said that all of existence, no existence, not even the smallest bit of existence is worth anything. It's like feces. If you have the smallest bit of feces, it's still feces. And it's something that's hard for us to swallow because we're so enamored by and caught up in experience. What else is there, right? So we've got a lot of learning to do. Another aspect of this is how how deeply we have our claws or how deeply samsara has its claws in us. How deeply intertwined, how deeply who we are. Who we are is, is a part of the problem. It's a part of samsara. It's causing us suffering, stress. And so the Buddha's teaching is about freeing ourselves from this system, freeing ourselves from ourselves, really. I just got a letter this evening from uh, someone telling me a friend of hers. I didn't read it carefully, but uh, stationed in Afghanistan or something who has been following my teachings online. It sort of made me think of this whole idea as well of how small the, the, the universe is, how how connected we all are.
happens. I mean, that's really the great part of of the the the, the universe is how easy it is to make this connection and to find a, to find the Buddha's teaching even from all around the globe how easy it is for angels to, to come and to hear the Buddha's teaching as well because of the, nat the nature of the world as being somehow connected not so big But the greatest lesson from all of this is to see through our ambitions and, and our even our our path in life and if, whatever path we've chosen outside of the search for freedom from suffering you know, has to be suspect because it's caught up in things that can't satisfy us it's caught up in impermanent phenomena it's caught up in this Terrible, terribly useless and meaningless universe that we find ourselves in. Purpose. I'm purposely trying to be challenging here. I'm imagining that this video is probably going to get the most downvotes in a while. I always check on YouTube to see upvotes, downvotes. Just to see. I think this one's probably going to get a lot of downvotes. It's challenging. The Buddha said, "Most uh, Mahasi Sayada says most people aren't interested." He has this nice quote where he says, "Most people are inst interested in the Dhamma for this reason." I can boldly say this. I mean, it sounds awful. I th I would think for most people this sounds very hard to swallow, if not outright um, unpleasant. But you, this can be said because. We have we have something. You know, we we have a a very powerful truth, uh, and that is the key to freedom from suffering. That that the powerful truth is that you can cling to samsara all you want, but you can't deny that it's got that you're suffering. You may not think that it's samsara that's causing it, or the universe, or your goals or ambitions, but you know that you are suffering. It doesn't take much to, to see that. And so we lay this bold claim that you're suffering because of your ambitions, not because you can't realize them, because, but because you have them in the first place. It's quite simple. I mean, if you let go, if you stop trying to be, be or find or become something, I mean, what suffering could come to you if, if nothing has a hold on you? Like, I wish this, I wish that, I want this, I want that. If you had none of that, how could you suffer? Where could all this stress come from? All this stress, all the stress we have, so much stress, right? If nothing had a hold on us, if there was nothing that we clung to, if we did see this universe just as, you know, meaningless, not in a bad way exactly, but in a meaningless way, you know. Yeah, it just it's you know it's like when you look at a rock, you don't think, wow, that rock has purpose. You think, no, it's just a rock. It doesn't bother you, but you don't cling to it. The problem is here we are clinging to this rock. And cling to all sorts of meaningless, useless things. All we have to do is look down and see, well, this is just a meaningless piece of stone. There's no benefit coming from my clinging to it. In fact, I'm hurting myself. That's the practice. That's what we do, is to actually look, not have theories and views. Like All of this may sound quite theoretical, and it involves theories. It involves people's theories and views. It challenges them. But we can boldly say, we can boldly back up, back up these claims. Come, see, look. If you look, you'll, this is what you'll see. Won't be pleasant. 
It won't be something. It won't be what you want to see, most likely. But it's what's real. It's what's there. You can't deny the fact, the the truth. Anyway, so I thought that would be an interesting food for thought for you all tonight. That's our dhamma for this evening. If anybody has any questions, I can answer them. Here's one from the online site. I have realized that from meditation I have created a lot of clinging and have meditated compulsively, feeling that I have to meditate, thus creating a great subtle aversion. This may be hard to answer directly, but it would be would it be advised to take a break from meditation and resume shortly, or would else would be appropriate? It would be appropriate to note the aversion. If you don't like to meditate, just say disliking, disliking. Meditate on it. That's normal. Meditation is terribly uncomfortable a lot of the time. So it's quite normal for you to start to dislike it. That's just your mind complaining. The Visuddhimagga talks about this. It says, when you want to teach a baby ox, you have to take it away from its mother, tie it to a stake, and just let it run. And it will scream and it will pull against the rope. But if you have a strong, strong rope and a strong wooden stake, you can keep it and eventually it will get tired. So let the mind go. The meditation isn't painful, it isn't unpleasant, but our mind wants such pleasant things. So just let it go. It's different from torturing yourself. Just keep going, keep meditating. You're not torturing yourself. Your mind is just whining and complaining. It'll get over it. I mean, if you stick with it, it will. So that was it. One question. If there are no other local questions, I think I'll just say good night. Can one invite angels to listen to the Dhamma and how? That's common for people to invite. It's a common Buddhist thing. When a monk would give the would give a Dhamma talk, a formal talk, they will invite the angels to come. And nowadays when monks give blessings, they'll invite the angels to come and listen. So we used to we ha we have this chant Sage Kame Chorupe Kirisi Karate De Chantalike Vimane Tipe rate jakame taluanagahane aramavatumi kete bumma jayantu deva chalatalavisame yakaganta banaka. It's basically saying all angels of all sorts on earth and in heaven and wherever they may be. Dhamma savanakalo ayam badanta. This is the time for the Dhamma. This is the time for listening to the Dhamma. Oh, oh, uh, oh. Uh, respected ones Dhamma Savanakalo Yampadanta Dhamma Savanakalo Yampadanta Yeah, I'd imagine the angels, the Buddhist angels are having their Dhamma talks and Dhamma discourses, Dhamma discussions and they're probably still coming down to earth to find the good monks There's probably lots of angels around Ajahn Tong I would think. Never saw any lighting up Jom Tong like Chetawana Rama. Okay, well, let's call it a night then. Thank you all for coming out. Wishing you all good practice. <laughs>